Um, okay. Good afternoon okay. to everyone. Welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Scaling and Innovating. My name is Naima McQueen. I am a Mills alum, um, a conference organizer alum. I'm currently the Executive Director for Alliance for Community Development here in the Bay Area. Um, and today's moderator. I'm really excited to have this conversation with our incredible panelists. Um, I've got a few questions already prepared for folks, but then I'm going to open it up for Q&A. So I invite you to drop your questions in the Q&A section, right? Anytime someone says something that you feel in your heart, something that speaks to you, feel free to let us know in the chat. We'll be toggling between both. Um, that is enough of me speaking. Let's turn it over to our panelists. Let's go ahead and start with introductions, your name, pronouns, and let's, let's get a little crazy. Let's do a 45-second elevator pitch before our first question. And let's start off with Jenny. Okay. Hi, I'm Jenny Sheridan, uh, pronoun she, her. And I'm a proud alum of Mills College. I did the master's in management program, graduated in 2017. Um, yeah, I'll talk more when we get into the question area, but I'm a business attorney and I'm working on the programs to basically fill in the gaps for both law students who want to be startup lawyers and then startups who have not had their legal needs met. So I can talk more later about the programs I'm doing. But um, yeah, really excited to be here. Thanks, Jenny. And will you go ahead and pass it to the next person? Hi, you're above me, so. <laughs> Hi, greetings, everyone. My name is Kai Norte. I'm from Oakland, California. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kube Nice Cream. So at Kube, we're really leading the next inclusive and full circle regenerative economy to inspire, transform, and awaken lives with vegan ice cream manufacturing, okay? So we're building economic liberation models with a triple bottom line of restorative economics, racial and, just, racial and gender equity, and ecology. And we make the most clean and best tasting non-dairy coconut ice cream. So even if you don't like coconut, you will love it. We don't use synthetic chemicals. This is about really creating liberation, economic liberation models in Oakland, California, and in other countries in the Southern Hemisphere that don't have plant-based ice cream manufacturing. We'll talk more about that later. <laughs> Thank you. And Reem? Yeah, I'll go. Um, so I'm Reem Rahim Hassani. Um, I co-founded Numi uh, Organic Tea in Oakland too. And I like to think we have a quintuple uh, bottom line company uh, based on people, planet, profits, product, because we're a healing tea and purpose, which is to create and catalyze change in the world. And my brother and I started the company in a small apartment in Oakland, and now we are distributed nationally and globally. Uh, we are um, organic and fair trade company, which means that, um, well, organic means that it's pure and clean, free of pesticides and chemicals. Uh, we use all real ingredients, so it's an exceptional product with ex exceptional taste. And fair trade is that we um, give back a premium to the farmers, which contributes to um, uh, community programs, um, schools, roads, mosquito nets, all kinds of things. And I can talk about more about that later too. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank y'all for your introductions. I have to, I have to acknowledge I'm really excited because I've been in the Bay now for about five years, moved out specifically to go to Mills, get this MBA and work with small businesses. And I've had the pleasure of directly and indirectly working with all of you across that time. I've done events where Numi Tea has been one of our vendors. I've both listened to Jenny lecture and then co-lecture in a class, right? I've worked with Ty, my, my wife has worked with Ty, and so keeping it in the family. So I'm really excited to delve a little bit deeper about the incredible work you're all doing. Um, so the first question I have for you all is what called you to entrepreneurship and what legacy do you hope to leave behind? And I'd love to start with Reem. So oh, I guess I would say I wasn't really called in. Um, I kind of tripped in <laughs> um, out of frustration and, um, I was, um, I was an engineering student uh, when I was um, a long time ago, I won't date myself. And um, then I turned to art um, for personal reasons, uh, just for healing. And, um, and I, was a, I was a substitute art teacher 
a <clears throat> teacher and a teacher and a substitute teacher and all kinds of things for a while. And I was driving home one day, uh, commuting in the Bay Area for hours, and I was really frustrated. And I recalled a couple of uh, pieces of advice I had gotten, one from a, a, an ex-boyfriend who said, just grind your teeth and do it, which meant you know, <laughs> do the fear, whatever the fear is. And my father, who used to tell me, just choose one thing um, and master that thing, um, because I was a sort of, you know, jack of all trades. And, um, and I had had so many ideas. And one of them was to import a tea I drank as a child um, in Iraq, which is where we were born, my brother and I, and um, uh, called Numi. And it's a dry desert lime. Uh, it's one of our teas. Um, and so we had met up on a family trip um, in the Grand Canyon, and he was thinking about the idea at the same time. And so we just decided to fuse our passions. He had he was operating tea houses in Europe where he was living, so he knew a lot about tea. I was an artist, and so we fused our passions together. And I did all the um, packaging for the uh, all the artwork for the packaging, um, original packaging, um, inspired by photographs he'd taken. And uh, so there we were born. So I learned entrepreneurship. I never thought I would do that, uh, but I've learned a lot over the last 22 years on the job training. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's a big difference going to school and um, learning business than just learning it, um, you, know, uh, you know, boots and straps by um, just working it. So very fortunate for that. Thank you. I love that you said that you tripped into it because I think that that's how I share my story as well. Like this jack of all trades, generalist nature, and it just sort of lends itself to the work that we do in entrepreneurship. One of the things we talk about at Alliance is really around the fact that this work is, is ever evolving, right? It's like you're a perpetual student because there's always something else to learn around entrepreneurship. Um, Kai, can you tell us you know your story and how did you how were you called to entrepreneurship what legacy yes. do you want to leave behind with with your business yes thank you naima um yes i come from a multi uh disciplinary background i'll say first it was started really as a child i grew up in a very politically activist family in oakland california so my parents were in progressive labor party so we grew up around communism com we were communists so you can say socialism is the next stage, but I'm not a communist, but I'm saying this is what we had going on in our living rooms. We had college students, AC transit bus drivers talking about creating economic liberation models. What was our future going to look like? How were we going to redefine what the restorative future was going to look like for ourselves and for their families? Advocating for healthcare, right, benefits, all these things. So I grew up around a lot of political, uh, political activists and I became an activist actually um, in high school and in college around against mass incarceration. So for me, it was all about rehabilitative opportunities, right, that are restoring the lives of people, uh, that are restoring the health of people. I also grew up, again, when I talk about the interdisciplinary background that I'm from, I grew up with a huge organic garden in the backyard. So we had compost. I understood at an early age in second grade what compost was, you know, taking our pills and um, of oranges and bananas, like and seeds, all these things, right, that create good, healthy soil. So when I talk about regenerative soil, it's coming from my childhood. I had these very deep conversations with my mother in the garden. And then later on, as I went to school, college, I was interested in science and sociology, and I thought I wanted to be a doctor, right? But I realized that wasn't for me. I realized that I love sociology. So for me, I worked in you know, a lot of juvenile justice programs, like youth development programs, and work with a lot of young women and teenagers on probation and really teaching uh, uh, classes on self-confidence, personal transformation, staying creative. So for me, really, it was about bringing all my skills and passion together in a way that was gonna restore life, health, joy, dignity, and equity back to people. And on that journey, I became lactose intolerant. On that journey, on that food journey, I became vegan, right? And that, that was a whole process. So it's really about, you know, Kube, I say Kube and we exist to restore life, health, joy, dignity, and equity back to people. Again, because capitalism has stripped so much dignity 
and humanity from people. So, so we have to have new models. And so it's a culmination. Kube is the culmination. So for me, my legacy is to leave behind, to really shift material resources back to black and brown people all over the world in the Southern hemisphere. Because why is it that 90% of Africans of the diaspora are lactose intolerant, 0% own plant-based ice cream manufacturing? So Kube is here to change that in that landscape. Thank you. <laughs> muted myself. Let me tell you, when Danielle was working on her project last year and brought back samples, it was the best part. I was in the experience with her. I was like, yes, thank you. All of this part to keep bringing it home for us. So thank you so much for sharing that story. You're we welcome. are, we love Kube in our house and it, it is, it is a staple. So I love hearing that origin thank story. You. And Jenny, um, Jenny, what, what calls you to entrepreneurship? What is the legacy you're looking to leave behind? Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm very honored to be here and thankful for all the people I know behind the scenes that have put together this conference. Uh, <laughs> it's really great, Paul. So uh, yeah, my story is also was kind of happenstance. I mean, I found myself in the 90s um, in the Bay Area, it really in Silicon Valley, a single mom. I had to restart my career. I had taken some time off for it. Um, and to tell you the truth, I mean, when I look back and you know, I talk to you know, family, friends, other generations, it's interesting how your life changes and what your yeah. goals and visions are over years, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I went to law school planning to be an international lawyer. I don't know if I even really knew what that meant, but <laughs> I had done some international development work. And so I was all excited about that. And then again, personal life kind of intervened. And like I said, I was in the 90s, had to restart my career. And I was fortunate to get a position as an attorney and get started again. But where it really turned for me was when I took an in-house position, which was more, again, help, worked better for me as a, a single mom than being in a law firm. And I had to learn about intellectual property and I was supporting, again, entrepreneurs. And I found it very exciting. I was like, I didn't go to law school, I didn't do this in law school, but I just really enjoyed you know, working with them as a team member. And then I got an opportunity to teach at Santa Clara Law School and actually put together curriculum for what a class we call tech transaction. And I was just thinking of, as when I had been a law student, we all say we don't learn how to practice law. So I wanted to offer the student something more practical. So I developed this simulation-based curriculum for them. And then students would come up to me and say, you know, professor, how can we get that in-house position? We want to, you know, work, you know, and I learned that there weren't the opportunities for these law students to get that law firm position that they kind of needed, that's a traditional route, to then work in-house or start their own practice. And honestly, here we are, you know, 20 plus years later, it hasn't changed at all. So what I'm doing in, a, in, in addition to my law practice is to develop a training program so that law students and recent grads can get that training so that either it'll help them in their career, but also they could start practicing startup law. And what I'm working with a small group right now, we just started last year, and we're launching something called Startup Law Forum, which will be a mentoring networking organization, but entrepreneurs can come onto our site and either learn directly or work with one of the members to help them with their needs. And it's all about accessibility. And one thing I just wanted to say is I, you know, I, and I do believe this, and I say this in my curriculum that I really see entrepreneurship as democratizing economic opportunities. Now that doesn't say that honestly, we all know we have problems with shortage of housing, healthcare. I mean, all of those things, you need that foundation. But being able to be an entrepreneur is, it's not only exciting, you can feel an impact, right? About yeah. your ideas directly, like what we're hearing from Kai with Reem, what you're doing. So I am just very excited to be part of this. And what I hope my legacy will be is that I'll create a group of people that can carry this on and continue to democratize, again, these opportunities so I'm starting with the legal side, but it's going to actually support these entrepreneurs that need the support that can't get it in our current model. Yes. 
I'm so excited. I know that half of my team has joined today and I hope they're taking notes because that is something we'd absolutely love to talk to you more about in terms of getting more folks exposure to, to Startup Law Forum and what that can look like for people because it can be nebulous in this space and we know it. A lot of us have learned um, how to be entrepreneurs, how to show up in entrepreneurial spaces through trial and fire. And so to the extent that we can offer more opportunities, accessible and equitable opportunities for folks to thrive in this space, the more that we're doing the work we said we set out, we were, we set out to do in the first place. Um, I really just want to extend my, my thanks to you all for sharing your stories and your vision for your legacy. Um, and I'd like to take it a little bit more into the nuts and bolts, right? Y'all have these amazing visions all of which are meant to support community around you. Um, how did you determine what business and financial model would best suit that vision? And I ask this because I think that lots of times like we talk about our stories and then on the other side of it, when we're seeking funding, those financials, those numbers also tell a different story, right? So our goal as entrepreneurs is to make sure that those two, those two forms of storytelling match. Um, so maybe Kai, could you tell us a little bit more about, you know, how you determined your business and financial model so that you could maintain your vision without having to trade off? Absolutely. I think it really started with just where you are. I always tell entrepreneurs, you got to start just where you are and test your product or your service. So that means you're going to have to bootstrap a little bit. You may, you have your MVP minimum viable product, right? So it doesn't have all the vessel, the, the, the whistles and everything. It's not all fancy, right? You start where you are and that's what we did, right? So you, you put in some of the money, some of the capital yourself, then you have to test it. You get surveys, you find other people you don't know to try it. And then you get feedback and you refine and you, you know, iterate and iterate. And so I think feedback is important. The next thing I think every entrepreneur should have is a securities attorney, because there's a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs that get wowed by these. They expect you to sell your business by a certain time, and maybe you don't want to sell your business within five you know, to eight years. So you really want to have control. So what I did is that I sought out a um, securities attorney. I found one, Jenny Casson. Um, I'm going to also seek out Jennifer as well, because I love all the knowledge that she also provides. Um, and there's, there's others out there too. Um, but I think it's really important to know what do you have a value to offer society as an entrepreneur, right? Like what, like for us, we have patented equipment that we've invented that's patented by the UPS, USPTO office, right? So, so it's using that equipment and then creating jobs and then figuring out, I mean, there's, there's stepping stones, but I think you want to learn about a term sheet. So when I, we first, I'll just fast forward this. When we raised capital, we raised revenue-based debt. But I want to make it clear that we put in thousands of dollars and tens of thousands. We Currently, we put in $250,000 of our own in cash over the last five years. Now, not everybody can do that, but you might have to put in 10, 20,000 initially. I mean, I'm a manufacturer. I have big equipment. Ice cream equipment is not cheap. It's not, I mean, it's expensive, right? And so what we did was we wanted control. So I talked to Jenny Casson and I said, you know, I really want to stay in control of my business. I have values. I want to attract the right investors that have similar values. I want to do revenue-based debt where I I can create a term sheet and I can put the material terms. And if I want to pay them all back in 10 years, I get to do that. And if I want to say I'm going to pay them 1.35 times the amount that they invested in me, I can do that. I don't have to pay them 2x, uh, two, you know, two times whatever they invested in. So, I mean, she she had an entire year of workshop on how to raise capital you know, a revenue based debt, or do you want to give equity? And so having those conversations that I could never have in college, like I was so frustrated that I never got to have these conversations in college, right? Like I had so many uh, discussions about racial and gender equity and ecology. You know, I came from an interdisciplinary science and food science background. So why didn't I ever have that conversation? So that has helped me stay in control of my business. Um, I know all my values aligned investors, but now I'm ready to sell uh, non voting preferred equity. That means investors don't get to decide the vision and they don't get to decide where my business goes. I get to decide that. So understanding that I get to sell non voting preferred stock 
You know, that that is so monumental. The fact that I have a term sheet and an offering and I can walk into any room and say, I invite you to invest in Kube. This is what we're doing. This is why people love it. This We don't use synthetic chemicals. We're building the next inclusive economy, regenerative economy, which is all about restoring life back to people, the soil and animals. And so I just find it very empowering to talk to a securities attorney, get your own term sheet and talk about what would that look like and when you can actually make your first payment to investors and how that can be based on your revenue, whether it's whether it's high, whether it's low. So I think um, people need that intellectual um, dialectical discussion first to figure out what is it that they want to offer investors. My heart is racing. I see that Nina Nina Robinson put in the chat, building term sheets based on your values. And that's that's what it is, right? How do I, right? Money is inherently personal, right? How we spend our money speaks to our values. So it's no less just as important in business. So to hear you talking about developing a term sheet literally on your own terms, right? Based on what yeah, makes yeah. sense for your business and your vision is probably one of the most inspiring things I've heard. Like that, uh, I'm nerdy. Yeah, I'm because no business is now. the same, right? right. Every business is different and they might bring in revenue differently. Yeah. You know, and like for us right now, we're selling monthly. We're not selling every day. We have to hire. We'll be hiring very soon to be able to sell once a week. You know, and people go online and they purchase online, but we're selling out of 80 percent of inventory in the first two and a half hours. We don't want our products in all of the stores because the stores exploit you and they take away your margin. So we're coming up with new strategies to be able to, you know, own, maintain our high margins. And so we have a strategy for that. But it requires critiquing all the holes in capitalism that have kept so many entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of color down. And so we're saying, nah, we're, we're rebuilding the future and we're going to do it on our own terms. And it requires going a little slower, you know, than what VCs like <laughs> or what other folks would really like. So I just wanted to add that. No, thank you so much. Much appreciated for your candid responses. Um, Reem, wondering the same question for you. How were you able to develop a, both a, a business and financial model that spoke to your values and like Um. Yeah, good for you, Kai. Um, I, I, um, you know, like, she, like Kai said, when you first start, you're just trying to figure things out and you've got a product. Um, but, I, but as we, you know, kept going um, day after day and year after year, certain things became more and more important and more and more evident for us. So at one point, probably in our third or fourth year, we converted all of our teas to be organic. So some of them were, but not all, but it was really important. I think as a, um, as a manufacturer and as a company, you know, you cannot, um, you have to practice what you preach in a way. So you cannot say, you know, people have to recycle or do this or that. And, 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 and you're not taking care of whatever you can in your model because you're producing a ton of stuff. <laughs> and being a person who doesn't like a lot of stuff, you know, you have to kind of be very conscious of, of your, what your produce, what you're producing and what you're putting out in the world. So uh, we made it uh, very, we were very conscious of producing, of, of, of um, sourcing organic tea. And then, and then, you know, you are, people buy from people. Uh, so uh, having those relationships with uh, the farmers that you're purchasing from um, we've had now the same farmers for the last 20 years, uh, because we value those partnerships. You have partnerships with people. And so where we didn't get fair trade teas from certain farmers, which means that you're paying an extra premium so that, that, that community, it's a community, uh, led effort, um, and they choose where those monies go. So whether they're building roads for their children to go to school so they don't have to walk hours and hours, uh, purchasing mosquito nets so they don't get malaria, um, having female empowerment programs uh, where people, where women can work from home, just all these To date, we've um, given over a million dollars of fair trade premiums to our farmers. And when we go to them and ask them what they need, which is what we do, they'll say buy more tea because it's improved their lives and their livelihoods and their communities. So um, 
where, where we couldn't find fair trade teas because they have certain um, you know, regions where Transfair works with the, the organization, we created a new um, certificate called um, Fair Labor, uh, which is kind of a point system and you can keep improving. So where we're constantly trying to innovate where we saw, and, and just to kind of echo, it's your values. You're a person who's creating a business. So, you know, you can put whatever values you want into it. You can either have a, you know, a, a conventional or a, a, a traditional capitalist exploitive model, or you can have a regenerative model. It's your choice. So yeah. uh, we continue to make those choices as we went. Um, go ahead, Kai. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. <laughs> no, okay. I was just nodding. So, yeah. So, um, so we, we continue to do that and just this year, and in, ter in terms of how you build it into your term sheet, you, you do it. You either make a choice to, uh, you know, take a portion of your margin, lose a portion of your margin because you're giving it back to the people that you're purchasing it from. Um, uh, you know, it's, 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 it, but it, again, it's not, um, it's not an absolute, I guess I would say, it's a process. So you're constantly having those conversations um, internally. Uh, this year, uh, we converted all of our wrappers to be plant-based wrappers. So they're all made out of um, uh, non-GMO sugarcane and eucalyptus. Now that's millions of tea bags that we converted and it took us a while to get there. It took oh, us yeah. 10 years actually oh, yeah. to um, convert, to find a filmmaker that would, uh, uh, you know, we had to collaborate with other organizations um, to uh, to put pressure on the film industry, film industry meaning manufacturers yes. of, of you know, films, to, um, to get a new structure. And we finally came up with it. We tested it. So 10 years in the making, things take time oh. and, and investment. So once we finally made that investment and converted all of our tea bags, uh, at this point, we're um, yeah. offsetting about 14 metric tons of, of virgin plastic that could go mm -hmm. into landfills. So um, all of our packaging is uh, either soy-based inks or post-consumer waste boxes, uh, no shrink wrap, and now a plant-based uh, tea wrapper. So those efforts we did. And then we also have um, our NUMI Foundation where we have given back to the community, um, uh, both our farming community and our local community. I can talk about that later. <laughs> I don't want to take up too much time. Um, so you just kind of just keep going, just keep going, keep thinking outside the box, literally, or outside the uh, envelope and um, do what you can to bring your values to the world and build it in. You mm -hmm. have to just build it into your financial model mm -hmm. and then attract investors who believe in you. Mm -hmm. So if they don't believe in you, you know, there's lots of, lots of money out there. So you just have to keep attracting the ones that believe in you believe in what you're doing. I want to just uplift this. I mean, I want to uplift everything that you said, but also this idea that um, in attracting the investors that believe in you is something to think about, right? And, and that you're building your financial models and your term sheets based on these values, like Kai said, like all of these are key things in terms of how we disrupt industries that, you know, for a long time were very exclusionary for women, women of color. Um, and now that there's a way to shift and, and really play this or do this work rather um, with our voices as loud as possible. And that's really exciting. So thank you both for sharing. Um, I know that we're just at the 30 minute mark and I always wanna make sure I leave enough time for all the questions because I see a couple of them popping up in the Q&A queue. Um, so our next question is really about who helps you. I had the pleasure of um, leading a course for Mills yesterday where we talked about um, funding your business and we had a great smaller panel. And one of the panelists said, you know, we have, we talked about solopreneurs, but nobody's really solo in entrepreneurship. And so the question I have for you all is who is on your personal board of advisors, right? Who's in your corner, um, both sort of officially and unofficially helping you make key decisions helping to inspire you, helping to challenge you. Um, Jenny, maybe you can speak to this first. Oh, good, okay. And before I answer that question, just a couple things came to mind listening with Kai and Reem. First, just what I kind of consider low hanging fruit on intellectual property tips I want to give, and I see this when I do my workshops, is two really important documents. And I'm always happy, you know, it won't be an attorney-client relationship, but I'll hand these over and you can run with them. 
and I'm sure Kai and Reem are familiar with these, but first a non-disclosure agreement to protect your trade secrets, just, you know, and sometimes you have issues getting an investor to sign it, but suppliers, customers, contractors, whatever, really important. And then the second is an assignment of intellectual property. And actually those can be a combined document for employees, but the assignment of intellectual property, just important to make sure that your entity owns, even the founder, that the entity owns intellectual property. Um, I, you know, do pro bono work. I'm on these listers with other women attorneys and something just came across about uh, a nonprofit where the executive director has left and now they're worried about who has owns the IP. And I'm like, did you have any of these documents? No. So just again, reach out to me if anybody wants those documents, I'm happy to offer those up. Um, so yeah, I'm in the process of doing this for my work, you know, again, putting on the entrepreneur hat for myself with Startup Law Bootcamp and Startup Law Forum is, uh, and I'm in a business coaching group that's been really helpful for me, especially as I think as women, one of the things that we're often not comfortable talking about money, asking for money, asking for our value. So I have found that really helpful, This the coaching group, and I'm working on it's not formalized yet, but my advisors, and I look at it as my strategic advisors. And for me, since I want to kind of combine, uh, at least for Startup Law Bootcamp, law schools and the legal community, I am looking at some advisors that I know in the academy that want to really effect change. I, I see our 3L year should just be about simulation and training so that they can hit the ground running. And then in practice, a lot of people who I know are ready to give back and, and support this venture. So, and then on the business plan side, I've got some advisors that are going to look at my business plan. So I'm in a really early stage, I'm sure compared to Kai and Reem, but yeah, that's, I realized very important to have an advisor group. Thank you. What about for you, Reem? Uh, well, for me, I think my my biggest advisors um, have been the people I work with. I um, most of my friends are not business people, um, uh, with the exception of maybe one or two. <laughs> so, um, although she has advised me a ton, and she's my sister, and um, just we just share stories and uh, support one another. Um, uh, so that said, I would say my brother, uh, who's my ally and just constant pusher uh, and challenger. Um, so, and that's gotten me to grow just as a person um, working with a sibling. So uh, if anybody has ever done that, um, it has its challenges and it has its definitely its benefits. Um, and I would say um, all the uh, people we have hired over the years have taught me so much about what it means to be a leader, um, uh, where to push oneself, um, what 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 needs to be learned, how to be open to learning. Um, for me, having a business has been a catalyst for personal growth because not only am I working with my brother, it's working with people who, um, you know, working with your coworkers uh, who, who want to be respected and listened to and included and 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 as an entrepreneur i don't know if anybody you know whoever else is on this call you want to control things you want things your way you uh, <laughs> uh and letting go and a constant shedding in that sense and letting go and allowing people to um to thrive uh, i had one um, actually advisor from the get-go from the beginning say you know people are seeds all you need to do is um, is is water them and they will grow yeah. um, and I've loved that and that's been um, that's mm -hmm. a, a reminder so true. to um, allow everyone's you know brightest light to shine and um, have their capacities uh, expand constantly with their job roles and their, their skills and, and, and be teachers to you um, for how you can do business differently and have them challenge you with their knowledge and their and their inspiration and um and 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 what they want the business to be so it becomes a co-collaborated uh work of art really so it's been it's been a wonderful journey in that way thank you and kai 
Yes. Yeah, so building the for us, it's an advisory board because I don't have anybody else deciding we're on the board. So it's me, my husband, my co-founder. Um, it's very interesting. So I have folks, um, professionals who know more than me in various areas. I'm very thrilled and excited that I have a food scientist on board, a Puerto Rican woman. Uh, she's amazing. She is a, a pathogenic microbiologist. And I met her actually through the Women's Vegan Conference. Um, yes, she's amazing and she's helped so much because see, we have secured a 5,000 square feet manufacturing facility in Oakland and it's in construction right now. So that means I have an advisor, I have an architect, I have a black man architect who's amazing mm -hmm. in from Oakland, who's built factories, who's, who's he has built um, cafes, restaurants. I'm working with a project engineer, um, who has designed gelato factory so i'm telling you i have been you know the the person to attract the right people when you're doing the work consistently and you're you're critical of how the work should be done um in a restorative way you will attract the right people it takes time but you know um i guess my point is is that i'm still looking for the right import export um advisor and i just want to say this um, this is really important. The coconut cream industry has not had a lot of transparency. So you can get coconuts and you won't know where they're from. Um, currently, I get coconuts from Mexico and I've been trying to find where the farms are. And there's, I get the runaround. And so I want to talk about really quick that I finally found an organic uh, distributor and producer of organic coconuts in Colima, Mexico. And it took a long time. I was asking so many men in the plant-based food industry where they would not connect to me. I do want to make it clear, like there has been a lot of hate and jealousy um, that I've experienced from a lot of white men in the plant-based food industry who actually have asked me to come work for them because my product is so phenomenal. They say, oh, why don't you just come work for me? And I say, no, why don't you just invest in me? You should invest in me and invest in the future. I have these struggles. I am not afraid of positive conflict because that's the only way that you can actually change things. You're going to have to confront the issues at hand. Um, of course, there's a nice way to do that, right? Um, so I just want to make it clear that I've had an advisor who actually tried to steal my recipe, right? Who actually was in manufacturing. So this, I'm not on here to just tell people, you know, what they want to hear and all the fancy stuff. I'm here to talk about the realities. We're talking about building an anti-racist future, right? So I have to be very transparent and honest and say that there have been people who say they want to uh, support or invest in me, but they actually literally ask for my entire recipes so that they could go sell them to another country. So let, so I'm very smart. Like I did a year of law school, you know, like I'm just saying <laughs> that year of law school helped me along the way, but then I got my master's in marketing communications and PR because I knew I wanted to be go into business at some point. So having an attorney and, and letting that person go. And I said, you know, we're not on the same page. We have a different paradigm of how we are viewing things. I'm, we, we can't work together. You know, because this this advisor who had a manufacturing company said, oh, I have a lot of manufacturing experience. I can help you. I Oh, I believe in your product. He was an opportunist. He knows that Kube is on the glow up, but he wanted to steal from me. And it's very I could feel it. I I have, you know, a really good conscious and I can un I understand what conscious leadership looks like. And he was trying to. Uh, force me to do certain things and then say, oh, no, but you don't have to. But I think you should have a board of advisors. And then he talked to my attorney and then he said, what are you smoking? No one writes contracts like this. What? Why is Kai selling non-voting preferred stock? I said, excuse me. Didn't we have that conversation earlier? Why, why are you asking my attorney this? We, we, we're clear. I'm clear that I'm selling non-voting preferred stock. No, shareholders don't have a right to vote. <laughs> no, because this is why things are so messed up in society right now, right? So investors should be investing in the vision. Yes, I will listen to you, but I will create my own advisory board. So even if you take investment from other uh, uh, investors, you need to know that you can create as an entrepreneur you can create your own advisory board yes you don't have to have that investor sit on the board and tell you what to do now maybe maybe that works for someone and maybe it's a great relationship okay 
But, you know, when it comes to black entrepreneurs, we have a different experience with people trying to tell us what to do and trying to force us to sell our business or force us to trust them when trust has not been developed. So that's the key is developing trust. And I am so thankful and so blessed that I have attracted the right uh, um, advisors. I cannot tell you it is. I feel like the ancestors are holding me and supporting me and so many other people. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very thankful. Our manufacturing facility will open up in the next year. We will have a retail storefront and the Grand Hyatt is absolutely amazed. The new Grand Hyatt Hotel in the San Francisco airport is absolutely amazed by Kube. They want high quality vegan desserts and they are ready to work with us and money is not an issue for them. So I'm putting it out there that we are on our way to being international, but of course we start local. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kai. And actually that's a really great segue into one of our first audience questions. Um, this question is from Jocelyn Robinson. And the question is, when you were looking for investors, what would you say, um, or when you are looking for investors, rather, what would you say are the do's and don'ts? And that includes sort of who to stay away from, like how are you, how do you know when like a family investment or family loan works, whether you should be tapping into friends, banks, um, what is what do those do's and don'ts look like for you? And maybe we can start with Reem, pass to Kai, and then end with Jenny. I'm just sort of thinking through it. Um, uh, <laughs> First, uh, I think you you don't want to give away the bank, so make sure you hold on to um, hold on to majority share. So, like Kai is saying, you want to make the you want to make the final decisions and you want to make the voting decisions. So um, that's important. You need investors that uh, believe in your values. You don't want somebody to come in and all of a sudden, you know, change the game, change your model, um, all that, change your culture. Uh, you want to keep those things intact. So I think these are extremely important. Uh, we always looked for green money, which meant that, um, you know, there's, there's a component of um, sustainability, uh, that the businesses were focused on sustainability, um, both for people and planet. So uh, those were key values we looked for in the investor. Um, you know, we've we've had our we've had our goods and bads. Um, I will admit. So we um, had one investor uh, who was a wonderful person uh, at first, and um, we signed on a napkin in a restaurant, and um, and then he ended up. Uh, you know, stealing some of our, we went, we went to China with him to visit some of the farms and then he ended up kind of swooping the rug from under us and purchasing from oh, suppliers wow. and, uh, you know, creating the same products. Um, and then we had to end that relationship and buy, buy him out and that kind of wow. thing. Um, So as women, you know, trust your instincts. So a gut feeling like this person's creepy. I don't really like have a good yeah. feeling about them. Uh, they're too full of themselves, yeah. whatever those things are that turn you off. Trust those, trust those instincts and, and just say, sorry, no thanks. Um, okay. So a um, number of, a number of different factors, I would say, um, you know, so uh, to um, look for look for banks or investors that you that you believe in as well. So you believe in their model. Thank you, Reem. That's Kai. Um, I think a couple of things before you ask for investors, ask yourself, how have you invested first? Because there are some investors and, and when we think of investors, let's just think of them as regular people. OK, because you never know. You never know. You know, you might think, oh, this woman or this man is a secretary at this job, but you don't know what he inherited. You don't know if he actually started a business and then it's like, ah, I just want to be a receptionist, you know, three times a week. You don't know what people have, right, or what they are willing to invest. So don't assume that you think, oh, this is a wealthy person and this is not a wealthy person. You, you can't do that today. <laughs> so 
But one thing you do want to do is say, well, where do, where are my values aligned investors? So first you need to lay out what are your values? You need to ask yourself, do I want to sell my business in the next five to eight years? Or do I actually want to set the tone and the vision and work with others and create a great advisory board to help you refine that vision and refine the branding and all that, all those things, right? Because entrepreneurship is iteration, 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 right? And, and so you want to show the investors that you've invested in yourself, whether you put in a thousand dollars, two hundred dollars, but you also want to show you have some traction, right? Investors want to know, well, how am I going to get my money back? But they also want to invest in you creating a new world, a new restorative, just world for the soil, for the planet, for people and the animals, right? So you want to make it clear how you're going to do that. How are you doing that in small stages like right now, right? And then what is your traction like? Like how much are you, if you're selling a product, how much are you selling? Like if like for us, we have inventory and we're selling out of 80% of the inventory in the first two and a half hours online consistently. And so investors are like, wow, like people really want this. Like they're really showing they want this. Like, okay, so then I have to show if we sold every day, we think blah, blah, blah. Like we think X, Y, and Z. So you, so you wanna have, I would look at investors as like just having a conversation. It's not like you, you don't want to just ask for something right away. You want to you want to tell them it should really be a conversation about who you are, because see, they want to hear you talk. They want to see you get excited and light up about your your vision and and how you are thinking through it clearly um, and what you're doing right now. And then they can say, you know, I think I trust this person because honestly, it's not really how much you sold right right now. It's really, do I trust this person? It's do I believe in this person? Time after time again, investors say, I trust you. I see that you're doing this. I see that you're walking the talk. I see you've put in this effort and that you're you're talking to your customers. You're at the farmer's market. You're talking to them. You're, you know, you're building it. People, you know, people can sense sincerity and, and when someone's sincere and genuine, right? So I would just have a conversation with people um, and it could be friends of family. Maybe you start there, you start trying to, you know, build up your being comfortable and then go to conferences and say, oh man, I really like what you said, Reem, about this and that, about, you know, the supply chain. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm learning this, but I don't know this and I really need help. And so it's about talking to people. And then later you can ask Reem, would she, you know, would she personally invest in you? She can say no, be okay with no or yes, or I don't know, you know, but, but you, at some point you can't, you have, you cannot be afraid to ask for money because you're, you're providing so much value. So I would make a list of all the things that you're providing value to people, to society, uh, to the soil, how, you know, all those things. And then when you talk to people say, you know, I invite you to invest in me, but have the conversation first about what you're doing. Can I just share with you what I'm doing? And maybe you might know some investors who want, who may be interested in what I'm doing. And then you want to ask the person, what, what do you invest and what kind of things do you invest in? You want to ask, you know, what, what do they invest in? But I guess first and foremost, you should, you know, get comfortable with talking to people first about your business. And, and what value your business creates for society and for people, right? And then I would seek out an attorney when you know you have some real numbers and people want your product, then I would say, okay, now you need to start thinking about this term sheet and what are you offering, right? Because there's some investors that, that want just, I want to know when I'm getting my return on investment. And you're like, uh, this is going to be like a long term. <laughs> <laughs> we want to we want you to stay with us for a long time and there are some investors like look i just want to get in and get out so you want to know who you don't want to talk to like you may you know like if you want to sell your business fine in six years maybe you do want to talk to vcs and look up vcs that maybe care about so social impact to some degree so you have to there's so many things um I, I would still, I, I always recommend talking to uh, another securities attorney is Elizabeth C. Carter, black woman in Chicago. She's amazing too. Um, she also helps with, uh, um, sorry, regulation investment crowdfunding. So you may want to look at regulation investment crowdfunding. That's what I did. So you have investors that come on there, but you have to know them first and then you got to bring them to this place. Or you could think about just crowdfunding, donation crowdfunding. Do people know your product? Do people want to just donate to you? You can do that first. 
and then later go to regulation, investment, crowdfunding. You will need an attorney for that as well. So yeah, there's a lot there, but I would just recommend this book, How to Raise Capital on Your Own Terms Without Selling Your Soul. That's the only book I know that goes into how to find values aligned investors. That's by Jenny Kasten. Again, look up Elizabeth C. Carter. That's a black woman securities attorney in Chicago. She's phenomenal as well. We need to know all of them, y'all. We need to know all of them. And Jennifer, everybody look at Jennifer. <laughs> Sheridan, did I say your last name right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Everybody, I'm, I'm going to talk to uh, Jennifer, too. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Karen. And that brings us to Jenny. Jenny, um, just, just thinking through that question around investment and, and whether you have some thoughts around that. Yeah, a couple of thoughts. First, um, the you know, quick thing I want to say is, like, I, you know, counseled, especially new entrepreneurs and, like, often they're like you know recent grads or they're in school even and got the idea and i you know helping them along and my advice i think of it like honestly like going to the dentist i was just talking to somebody recently who's had terrible experience with dentists like, i would never go to a dentist that just advertised you know whether it was in the old days with yellow pages or the internet it's a referral thing it's really i go through a whole structure mm -hmm. and i fortunately knock on wood never had a bad experience and i've lived in a lot of places and had a lot of dental work because of just what i inherited so i tell them with entrepreneurs entrepreneurs is network 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 you should have your club whether that's formal or informal and there's so many around now it's, i mean especially in the bay area but i think every city's got entrepreneurial clubs of one form or another and you share information it's all so get i yeah. you've got to find out those backgrounds of the because you know you can have an nda but then you got to sue them or something so yeah <laughs> Yeah, and so I want to say that it's like so important to network and check out their reputation, do your due diligence, just like you would for your dentist or something else. And then, um, like, you know, I know the VC world, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. And yeah, it's very short term focused. Just think about it. if you're this VC investor, what you're thinking is what's your exit strategy? It's like, are we going to sell this company or in the back in the day, it was like, Oh, now it's pretty much, are you going to sell? And what I love about this conversation and what, you know, Kai and we were talking about, you know, cr creating a restorative culture, that is almost yeah. by nature longer term, yes. right? That's what I hear both of you yes. saying. Like, you realize you're here for the longer term. That's the way I look at my training and what I want to do in, in supporting the community. This is like the rest of my life, you know? Yes. Like, it is something that I am very personally invested in. So I doubt there would be, unless it was a VC just personally interested and in wanting to support it, that that would even, that, you know, model is going to work for that kind of long-term partnership, you know, yeah. with, with the vision that you have. But I love the tools you're mentioning, Kai. That's what I want to do on Startup Law Forum, too, is make that more available so entrepreneurs can go and learn. And then they can find somebody to support them too. But you know, you can teach yourself a lot, which you obviously have, both of you. So yeah. Okay. yeah. I just wanted to underscore what you're saying. I'm so happy that you're creating these workshops because I know another person who's made a non-dairy non-dairy yogurt. And she actually thought that um, and I, I know names, but I'm just saying there's a lot of corruption in all the industries. So as an entrepreneur, we can have a network that says, oh, I highly refer this person. That's what happened to me. I have a great network. But again, I'm a black woman entrepreneur. So I'm not going to be respected the same way this other person who was non-black was respected by the manufacturing person who was trying to steal my recipe. You know, and the, my network, the person in my network said, oh, my goodness, I'm so surprised. This is horrible. I feel really bad. You want me to talk to this person? I said, no, I'm going to handle it myself. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying like, you can have a great network, but that doesn't mean you let your guard down. You know, yeah. I had the person sign an NDA. I, you know, we had a small contract to work for a certain amount of time. I'm just, you know, re just explaining that, yes, you want to tap into your network, but that doesn't mean that person's going to be good to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Oh my goodness. I listen, between the questions I had prepared and the questions in this chat box, we could absolutely go for another hour, but I'm really sad to report we have two minutes. So I'm gonna make the most of this two minutes and I'm gonna pack this last question for everyone to end on. And if you could keep it to about 60 seconds, we'll go about a minute over and we'll make it work. Um, so the question is, what are some desired partnerships and collaborations that you see would best fit your business in the future? So that's the first part. And the second part is how can we here today support your business and the legacy that you're building with it? I'll go first. If you Thanks, Jenny. <laughs> uh, so first, you know, again, in, you know, reach out to me. I love to get testers on my curriculum and get feedback because I'm, again, building more entrepreneurs for my law trainees to work with. So, you know, want, want to get more there. My version, I guess, of you know, I know this is being recorded, so I don't mean any aspersions because I have so many good friends in the academy. But my version of kind of selling out would be, you know, just oh, I'm going to teach another course the way it's been taught in the current system of law schools as a professional school. Because law school, and Kai, you said you spent a year at law school. <laughs> you know how to think like a lawyer. Uh, we'll have to have off, off sidebar chats about that, but. Law school, you have doctrinal classes, like again, learning how to think like a lawyer, you know, especially a litigator. And then we have clinics, and I clinics are great. I did clinics, but it's not a safe place to make mistakes and learn the kind of things that you need to learn. So simulation-based training of what I'm doing is something more like happens in practice, but I, I'm, I'm, you know, re-envisioning that for law school, and then it's scalable because law schools have an incredible financial problem right now. So I am going to need a visionary dean or deans that was going to want to do something transformative <laughs> in law school, and particularly, it's almost the eighty-twenty rule. Eighty percent of the law schools can't place a lot of their grads in mm. those positions. So I feel like this will help a lot of other problems. And honestly, there is a huge effect. Of, of color and gender. Like it's no coincidence, probably like my group I'm working with, it's a wonderful group. They're all women, 80% of color, because the regional schools have a lot of these, you know, great students, but they're not getting those opportunities in the ladder. Right. So this is what I'm hoping, hoping to do. So sorry if I went over 60 seconds. It's worth it, I love it, thank you. Kai. Over to you. Okay, so um, it, how can everybody just support us? Please follow us on IG. I have videos on there. I have stories on there. Lots of pictures of the product. Um, check out our monthly sales. We're coming out with another sale this month. Um, and, and also come and pick up your products because right now we make products and we are, we're engaged with our customers. We know our customers and we ask our customers, please support us by coming to our commercial kitchen right now to pick up the product. And they do it. They do it, and if they can, we work out another day the following week where we meet them, and there's only a few that have to reschedule. But this ensures that we keep our margins high so that we can hire by June. And partnerships, partnerships are so key. So we have a partnership with plantingjustice.org um, in East Oakland. They have a huge farm there and another one I want to say in Richmond. So they have like, I don't know, it's over 5,000 acres. Anyway, they hire formerly incarcerated folks, teach them permaculture skills to uh, build edible gardens for community members. But they also, they have like a for-profit and a non-profit and they sell like peach trees and all types of evergreen trees all over the United States. Uh, the point is uh, we give them our byproducts. We give them the coconut shreds, which is a, a soil resource to make regenerative soil, right? So that they can grow more organic food for the low for low income communities in East Oakland. Um, we are forming a partnership with a young women's freedom center, which is a huge policy and leadership center that's been around for 30 years in San Francisco. Now it's in Oakland, now it's in L.A. And um, they work against the abuse of women, uh, LGBTQ, transgender folks. Right. And so they create like a self-determination, restorative economic class, where, um, you know, talking about how do we restore our li livelihood? We, we got our freedom. What are we going to do with it? How are we restoring our lives? Right. And the trauma counseling and all these different things. So we're going to be hiring women and some of them have uh, have uh, babies and kids. Well, we have a nursing room being developed in our manufacturing facility because we, I am a woman. I, I, you know, I once breastfed too. I once had to pump too. And there are women that need to go to work or they have to go to work and they need a safe space 
a, a comfortable space to breastfeed. So, so that's what I'm saying. Well, how do we build this anti-racist feature? It starts now. It's been, it started a long time ago, but it's, it's the investors and the foundations. Okay, this is what I really would like to see. I would like to see more foundations and philanthropists invest in entrepreneurs. Why? Because we're doing the work. We're doing the heavy work. This is not charity. We're providing value. We're creating jobs, right? I mean, we're restoring people's livelihoods. Um, back to them again into the soil into animals. I call I call Kube ice cream liberation ice cream because we're liberating people, animals in the soil from systems of abuse and from systems of that use synthetic chemicals. Right? This is a problem all over the world. Coconut ice cream is made with sodium metabisulfite, which is a bleaching chemical that causes gastrointestinal issues and hormonal issues. I'm saying we have a food justice issue. The whole entire system is broken, and we are going to do our part with non-dairy coconut ice cream because 80% of the world is lactose intolerant and 90% of Africans of the diaspora are lactose intolerant. So we don't want dairy being sold in Ghana and West Africa and all over Africa. That's, that's, that's hurting our survival chances. And is that by mistake or is it by design? That's the question. There's no non-dairy ice cream manufacturing facilities there. That, that's a political that's what we're going to be tackling. So we need partners. We want international like-minded values aligned partners who understand the significance of creating jobs in other countries when there's millions of coconut trees. If there's millions of coconut trees, there should not be an issue of not having, there should be coconut ice cream manufacturing if there's millions of coconut trees and there's farmers. So, so we're talking about a system that's been designed for abuse, and we're here to say no. We deserve better, and we're going to create that. Right? It's bigger than ice cream. Our ice cream is phenomenal, but it's bigger than ice cream. <laughs> Thank you, Kai. Thank you so much, and Reem. Amen, <laughs> Kai. Um, so I don't know where to leave off from there. Um, in, I'll just speak brief, uh, quick. Um, I. I'm going to put my marketing hat on because we've got a lot of partnerships through Oakland Unified School District with our um, gardening curriculums and um, local farmers uh, through um, our uh, farms, our uh, um, COVID relief program where we uh, uh, delivered organic produce to um, thousands of families um, during COVID times. We've got a lot of great partnerships. I'm going to put my marketing hat on, um, which is uh, around um, consumers. Um, we have great connections with our consumers, but I would love more connections with our consumers, um, and especially people of color, because I want NUMI to be available to all people. Um, everyone deserves a wonderful organic cup of tea. And um, we're, you know, the feedback uh, um, in terms of what we can create, uh, what um, you know, culturally relevant teas we can make. Um, I, I, I think that's really important that, you know, the organic natural food industry breaks down its paradigm um, of, of, of selling to, um, you know, rich white folks and uh, be able to sell to everyone. So that, that feedback would be wonderful. Um, and uh, that's the last question, sorry, um, around, um, uh, partnerships and sorry, and I had a brain freeze. But um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, how can everyone support? Oh, how can everybody support us? Um, yeah. So uh, feedback and educate, educate yourselves um, on uh, on clean food um, and uh, what to put in your bodies. Um, so you know, supporting companies like Kube and supporting other com companies that are not only doing good for the body, but doing good for the soul and doing good for the planet and doing pe good for um, people of color around the world that are doing the hard work of farming and tilling the soil and producing all the crops that we, you know, get to enjoy here in this country. So um, just educate yourselves um, around uh, what's natural, what's organic and um, companies that are of social benefit so that those companies do better and the companies that don't change their ways. So, I just want to thank y'all so much. I am super aware that we're a few minutes over. So thank you to all of you who stuck it out with us to the end. Y'all are so amazing. I can't wait to email you after to figure out how we can all co-conspire and figure out how to lift each other up in the work that we're doing. Thank Yay. you to our audience for joining us for all the action in the chat. 
Um, if y'all haven't had a chance to look at that chat, please look at how it is on fire with everything y'all have shared today. So thank you. Um, I know that the next sessions have started, teed it up for the next conversation around investment, which is happening now. So thank y'all again for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you all in the future.